now it's time to start next session. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Jivonia PZ from uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. So he will talk about AIDA, Material Cloud, and the computational workflows. So please. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks everybody. It's been a very interesting workshop up to now. And um, what I want to discuss today is uh, two aspects, actually. Uh, the first one is how in AIDA and Matthias Cloud, we achieve fair data access and sharing. In particular, of course, focusing on the field of computational material sciences, what we, what we do. And I would also add one more R actually to the R of fair, which is the R of reproducibility, which is something we push a lot to our infrastructure. But this will be probably the first uh, third of my talk. But in the second part, I want to discuss how to push fair beyond the quotation mark just data. I want to discuss about how we can achieve fair simulations and fair access and sharing of codes and workflows. So let me start maybe for just a comment. I tried to put at the top right here some fair letters. Some of them will be read sometimes. I'm trying to and trying to say which of the fair pillars I'm uh, addressing mostly in that specific slide. Let me start with a uh, quickly introduction of the challenges we have when we want to run high throughput simulations in a HPC fashion. And the first one is workflow automation. Uh, we need to have the tools to be able to run and, and, and manage complex workflows with advanced error handling. As we know, the codes can crash and we need to have a way to deal with those. And then we'll discuss this later how important this is. At the same time, of course, you don't need only the workflows themselves, but you also need to have an engine where the workflows can run in a robust way. And once you run all of this, you need to run to manage all the data which is produced, not only to store it in an efficient way, but also to be able to query for it. And finally, an important point for us is the one of reproducibility. In fact, you store enough information uh, in order to be able to fully reproduce any computational workflow. In order to address these challenges, we've been developing what we call the AIDA platform, which is a computational science infrastructure for high throughput workflows with full data provenance. It's an open source Python code. You have here some links, which indeed provides a number of features, including a scalable workflow engine, automated tracking with the full data provenance. I'm going to discuss in a moment what this means for those of you who don't know. Uh, has built in support for HPC computation, so you can just submit simulation on HPC, HPC facility and has a flexible plugin system. As we show, we now have a support for over a hundred different codes from material science mostly. So let me first start with the first part of the talk about fair data access and sharing as opposed to fair simulation access and sharing, which we'll discuss later. The, the key aspect we started from uh, in the core design of AIDA is the, the idea that you really want to represent the full data provenance, the full history of any piece of data you have and you bring into life when you run simulations. And the way it's designed is very simple. You start from the concept of any calculation has a number of inputs and a number of outputs. This could be a crystal structure, some parameters, and some output structure, some output forces and stresses, etc. And now, if you imagine that any piece of data can be the, out, the input of another calculation, you, you end up with a structure, which is that of a, a cyclic graph, where if you have a final result, let's say a band structure, you can easily just look at the graph and understand this structure, this band structure was generated by a given calculation with some parameters, and this the structure itself, the input crystal structure itself, was actually the output of another calculation, and the, all the inputs and all the outputs of any step. Up going up to the very original structure, let's say imported from some uh, experimental, for instance, crystallographic database. And this graph just gives you the idea of the concept. But when you look at real provenance graphs as created by AIDA, they look like this. So they are very easily quite complex, not because we represent things in a complex way, but that's really what we do as material scientists. When you run a molecular dynamics, maybe you have a mixed method, DFT, mixed with some semi-classical method. You have to run a lot of runs. You have to do some pre-processing, prepare the structure, run, the, run some dynamics, and so on. So the, the graph, which represents the inputs and the outputs of, outputs of every calculation, becomes very quickly very complex. And the, the one in the bottom here is a graphical representation of an actual database with the calculation of uh, you know 
basic electronic properties and Manet functions of only, I would say, only quotation mark 500 materials. So it's not even a high throughput database. I would say it's a mid throughput, maybe a mid to low throughput database. Still, the amount of connections you have in the database is already so large that uh, it's essentially impossible to reconstruct a posteriori. And indeed, in this talk, I would try to also mention how we address some of the issues which have been touched upon in the final questions uh, before the coffee break, how we can also infer by storing this graph, the reason why certain calculations have been run. And so even you know, the best uh, willing scientist who has been running this will not be able to really reproduce in detail what has been done, but just you know, and describe it in a paper. You really need to have a tool like AIDA that tracks this provenance while the simulation are run and keeps track of the full metadata, the full provenance information for any calculation. And once you have this, it becomes relatively easy a posteriori in a sense to look at this graph and understand what's happened and create any type of metadata format you want. And a few years ago, we already showed in practice how this could work in the case of integration of AIDA with a theoretical crystallographic open database, the theoretical counterpart of the COD database. Um, that defines the metadata format and we were able to implement an automatic converter that taken the AIDA graph was able to create all the theoretical metadata about the calculations. And since you're speaking about fair data, the other important thing is also how to make it easy for others to reuse the data. And so AIDA has features to export the full graph you have in your computer or parts of this graph, say maybe a subset of your calculations, and either share them with collaborators or upload them to public repositories. And one of them, which is the one we maintain and develop is called Materials Cloud, which has specific features tailored toward uh, uh, AIDA. And uh, in this sense, what I want to show just in the next three slides is how combining the graphs automatically generated with AIDA with the data sharing capabilities of Materials Cloud, you can really achieve fair data sharing. By the way, Materials Cloud is one of the GoFair implementation networks. So, Materials has a number of sections, some of which are more geared toward data generation. What I will focus now is just the last, say, last three sections, discover, explore, and archive, which are the one more relevant for the topic of fair data sharing. The first one I want to mention is the archive is uh, something in a sense very similar to Zenodo. It's an archive where you can deposit uh, files and data associated to a paper you've been produced. As you know, most uh, funding agencies now require you to write a DMP and to publish also the data associated to your paper in a fair way. And uh, Matthias Cloud Archive uses the same actually backend called Invenio as Zenodo and is, however, a curated and um, some actually moderated, I would say moderated and uh, topical database. It's about only materials science. And it's moderated in the sense that any entry submit, it's open to the world, so any of you can submit here data associated with your papers, if it's about material science. The moderation is not a scientific peer review. It's just a, a very lightweight process where uh, one of our moderators will look at your entry and give positive suggestions in order to improve the quality of the data you're submitting. And actually, uh, our experience, I would say, more than half of the entries require some request for feedback, but all authors typically get it in a very positive way because requests could be things like, please don't use an Excel format, use maybe a somewhat more open format, maybe uh, make sure this file uh, is in another open format, it's clear there's a readme explaining what the data is about, etc. The archive uh, is recommended by a number of journals already, like the Nature's Journal Scientific Data, and now also by the Open Research Europe Journal. And when you publish data there, beside the user fields, authors, affiliations, et cetera, it also gives you a DOI to your data. And uh, you can put data there, which is going to be guaranteed to be there for the next 10 years. And now, if you also have data which has been generated through AIDA, which is optional, in a sense, you can upload data here, which are just files and without using AIDA. But if you use AIDA, you can very easily create new sections in the other two sections I was mentioning, discover and explore. And we just show very briefly with an example what this means with the example of one of our studies, which is about discovering two dimensional materials by uh, simulations, by ex computational exfoliation. And since we did this with AIDA, we created one discover section, which is what we, our discover sections are essentially project based curated data sets. So that's a section about two dimensional materials. 
where for every material, we have uh, a list of computer properties and of interactive plots, so three-dimensional widgets to show the structure, interactive band structure plots, etc. But for any computer quantity, you have these little AIDA icons. And when you click on them, you jump on the Explorer section, which is essentially a browser for the full provenance graph. If you want, if you think AIDA like Git, so Git keeps track of the history of your source code and AIDA keeps track of the history of your simulation data, the Explore section plays the role of GitHub. It's a place where you can upload your Git repositories, or in this case, your AIDA graphs, and you can graphically inspect them. And so in this specific case, let's say I want to know how the band structure of uh, magnesium bromide was computed. I can just click here, and not only I see uh, the band structure, but here on the right, I see a small portion of the provenance graph, which I'm going to show live with a small uh, video now, where the central node is your band structure itself. And you can see this was generated by this green square, which is a quantum espresso calculation. If you click on it on this provenance browser, you can inspect all the inputs and all the outputs of the calculation, not only the raw inputs, so if you're and you know how quantum espresso works, you will recognize it as a quantum espresso input and a quantum espresso output, but you see the full part of the subset of the graph where you see all the inputs and outputs of this calculation. And so for instance, if you go to the input structure, you can visualize the structure, you can download the structure, but also you can also, uh, again, discover there are, what is the calculation that generated it? And you can go up in the history and discover, for instance, the input structure, was generated by a quantum espresso variable style calculation. And you can continue to go up and see all the parameters with which this calculation, this structure was relaxed and so on. So this kind of concludes the first part of my talk, which is about fair data sharing. I try to very quickly give you an idea why by putting together the provenance capabilities of AIDA and the visualization capabilities and sharing capabilities of materials cloud, you can achieve fair data sharing for computational data. But what I want to stress more in the next part of my talk is about how we can also have and achieve, try to achieve fair access and sharing for simulations. And as a kind of preliminary introduction, the first thing I want to stress is probably obvious is that given a material, what we do when we do research is we typically compute relatively advanced quantities. We can start from basic ones, like a band structure in this example, but we very easily go to much more advanced properties. We can be the output of GW calculation of molecular dynamics and so on. And these are always the result of a relatively complex workflow as I was mentioning before. Now the AIDA provenance graph, if you use AIDA, is a very detailed description of how that specific piece of data came to existence and which parameters were used to generate it. So if you have it, if you want, it's like a log of what has happened in the past or what someone else has run. However, having workflows is one step beyond because now you have, thanks to the workflow engine of AIDA, which provides a flexible Python interface to run, to run these workflows, you can not only have a description of what has been done by someone else, but you can run a new calculation or maybe another material or on the same material with different parameters using the same logic in a very simple way. The advantage of the, the workflow engine, which already provides out of the box a number of interesting features like robustness for connection drops to the supercomputer. And for instance, as a feature to allow to very easily implement error handlers, which are essentially functions which detect when a code crashes or has an issue and know how to fix the inputs and the outputs to make the calculation work. I will be describing this more in detail in a moment. Just to stress this, it's not that AIDA provides the header handles for any code. Every code workflow implementer will have to implement them, but AIDA provides a framework to write these error handlers and make this very easy. And of course, there's another bonus. If you run workflows for AIDA, not only you have the full automation of the workflow, but also automatically the provenance graph will be stored for you. Now, the first step to, be, to make this appealing and interesting for the community is that AIDA should support a, a relatively large number of codes. And uh, this, in a sense, is also about findability. What we've been doing since 2017 is to, to create on GitHub a, what we call the AIDA plugin registry, which is a very lightweight registry where anybody who has been developing a plugin or a workflow or any kind of support for AIDA can register it and just point to the, the GitHub repository of that code, the documentation, et cetera. Today, 
Actually, in the past five years, we've been spending quite some effort to create a community around AIDA. And as you see from the number of uh, plugin packages in the past five years, it's been steadily growing from the very beginning when there were only two or three, there were kind of Quantum Express and a couple more, to now where we have 66 different GitHub repositories providing different types of plugins with uh, essentially 100 or more code supported and more than 100 different workflows, which range from very basic ones to just take care of fixing and error handling of a code to relatively advanced ones for materials properties. Now, however, having a code is the first step. It's just the way to tell AIDA how to generate the input files, how to parse the output files of a code, and maybe how to deal with workflows. But what we really want to go is to have some kind of turnkey solutions, turnkey workflows. And here we'll try to use some similar analogy to what Stefan did yesterday. So I'm making an analogy with cars. And if you have a car, uh, say you want to drive your kids to school or you want to drive work, etc., you don't want to be an expert of an engine to know which pipes to connect to what. And you don't want to, you know, have you have no, if you change car, you want to have to learn again how to drive. You just want to be able to turn the key and drive. And in a sense, it's what we are trying to achieve with this idea of what I'm trying to to mention about fair access to simulation. We really want to have something where I press a button and I get a reliable simulation. And this again is about robustness. So we don't want the engine to break. So in the same way, we don't want the calculation to break. But also we want to make it as simple as possible. As in cars, you still need a driving license. So you might still want to have a user running it, have some basic knowledge of what a crystal structure is, what a bound structure is, what properties are being computed and what are the limitations of the methods we are using. But then we don't want to need, like in a car, if you want to change car and switch brand, you don't need to learn again how to drive, right? So the same way it would be nice to have a way where if you have been using, I don't know, Siesta and you want to switch to VASP, you don't have to learn again how to run these simulations. And so trying to make this a bit more concrete in our domain, as a non-expert, and here, when I say non-expert, and I'm speaking, as you see here, at the top about accessibility of simulations, I'm speaking maybe of a computational of a experimental scientist who want to have access to some simulation results, and maybe he didn't do a PhD in simulations. So as a non-expert of simulations, I would, like, I would like to be able to ask for something like this. I'd like to have the question of state, maybe run with this code, just because I have it maybe, or because I know it's better, I have a license for it, whatever reason which I have on this supercomputer with a given number of nodes, but I like that all the numerical parameters are automatically chosen for me, the basis set size, the K points, et cetera, to get converged results. And what I care in the end is I press a button, I wait for it to run, and I like to get some plot. And at the same time, however, and we show how this was a key design aspect for us. If now I have an expert user, a person with a PhD in simulations, I'd like to be able to understand which parameter we use, check them, and possibly adapt them as I want. Because of course, maybe the default parameters which are chosen here are not the one I want. And again, maybe one important thing, which maybe, maybe some people might ask, the goal of all of this is not to take out of the play, you know, the, the simulation people, expert people in simulations, that's actually the opposite. If now the people, experts in simulation can just help and discuss with experimentalists and focus on the science, we are essentially removing all the technicalities from it of knowing if my simulation is a converged cutoff and things like this. Really the goal of us as researchers should be really to focus on the science and not on the technicalities. And so if you want to make this possible and in the next slide I show how we, what we implemented actually, there are I think three main challenges. One, we want to have these turnkey solutions which involve a number of aspects, we involve robustness, so making sure we get a result, automatic error recovery, but also automatic parameter choice. The second aspect, as I mentioned, is we want to get this balance between accessibility for non-experts, but with full control for experts, for instance, about parameter choice. And also we'd like to have interoperability among different engines. As I said, I'd like to be able to switch code because maybe I prefer to do something in a plain way based set for some reason, and maybe a localized based set for some other task with same inputs and output formats without having to relearn everything. But as, I, as we learned very quickly, that is not, not any of these three is a large challenge. The largest challenge is to achieve all three of them at the same time. And so what did we do? Well, just a month ago, we published this paper 
which is uh, this demonstration of the implementation of common workflow interfaces to compute materials properties using 11 different quantum engines. That's an effort which started in the within the scope of the Max Center of Excellence, but actually very quickly was open to many more contributions. You see here all the code which are involved, some of them like CP2K, FLIR, Siesta, uh, Quantum Espresso, etc., are part of, of um, Max, but many others are not. And all what, as we, sh as we show in a moment, everything we did is fully open, both the data generated, but also the code. So you can find the code here and you can look into the paper. Uh, which is mentioned here. What I will do in the next uh, few slides, I will try to give you a sense of what we've been doing. So the idea in the end is the following. Let's say I want to compute an equation of state for say aluminum with the siesta code. Then now it's possible to just run this line. I, want, I just ask the Ada common workflows to launch an equation of state with siesta on the aluminum crystal structure, but here you can put any structure you want. We have a precise protocol, so we have a, precise, a choice of numerical parameters, which hopefully begin some kind of relatively high level of accuracy. And the important thing is now I can just change the string with any of the other 11 codes which were involved in the study, just press a button again, and the result that we get will be something like this, where hopefully everything matches, but I didn't have to tell the code which parameters to use. I will be, this is an actual figure from the paper, we'll be discussing the results in a moment. For now, I want to discuss a bit the philosophy behind it, and then I will show what the results are and what are the steps forward. So the first topic I mentioned is the automatic parameter determination. As you, of course, I guess, understand, and probably I think all of you had this experience, if you would describe what you did in the supplementary material, the method section of a paper, it's in 99.9% .9 of the cases, not enough. I'm pretty sure all of you had this experience trying to reproduce a paper, reading there, and not being able necessarily to reproduce everything. Because you know, it's not because of uh, you know, even the best will of the author, there will always be little things you cannot write in a, in a PDF text. Now, in order to determine these parameters, one option which we didn't do, which is quite complex, I think, is to define in a unique way all the possible parameters for any code. Say, if you define a cutoff, that's how it's called, that's how the units, and that's how you specify it. And then define a global best choice for any code. I know that it's very tricky because of codes might have different basis sets, different organization methods, so this would be very tricky. So we went for a more practical approach. We just define these protocol strings. So essentially we say every code will have to implement a uh, protocol called precise, a call, protocol called moderate, and so on. And what this means, it's up to the workflow implementer to the code specific expert. With the requirement that when we then compare the results, at least to the precise protocol, results should match within a certain level of precision. And again, the name is just a, a, a kind of human readable name. And in our supplementary information, we try to give him you know, a kind of a, an expert uh, should be able to read and understand and get a sense of what level of precision we are using. But as you will see, since this all run through AIDA, you can go and check exactly every numerical parameter once the simulation is run. So that's the part about um, parameter determination. So every workflow decides some parameters. And as I, I can tell you uh, at the beginning, when we started this, the first plot we got for the question of states, many of these plots were all over the place. But by iterative discussion together, we managed to align them and essentially to find robust choices of initial parameters. Now, our experience with running a lot of simulations also tells us that already choosing good initial parameters is key to robustness of a simulation. If you choose wrong parameters, the simulation might fail for a number of reasons. Already just choosing good ones helps. This, however, is not enough. If you run any DFT code, I think, I would say with confidence, almost any DFT code, I'm sure you have a number of issues you might encounter. Some are relatively basic, like you know, the wall time your supercomputer was reached, so you have to restart. But there may be a number of other things, like uh, SCF is not converged, or the organization method crashed, or you know, the last SCF had a large pressure, you have to restart the relaxation, et cetera. And for each of them, an experienced uh, say researcher for that code knows how to fix the problem, how to change the parameter in most cases. And so this can be automated. And I stress this fixing of errors is very code specific. 
And so AIDA, as I mentioned earlier, makes it easy to define handlers. We just decide error by error how to fix it, what inputs to change in order to try to achieve a converged result. Implementing it is up to each of these 11 or more plugin developers. And so the level of robustness of different codes we have might be different. Some might be much more advanced than others, but the good thing is it's very easy to add more. So if you discover there's a specific type of error failure, it's just a matter of adding one um, Python function to your workflow, which detects the error and will take care of it. Still, if you put together automatic parameters and robustness, it's already a lot of things, but it's not enough. Because still every code will have different ways of specifying the inputs, different output formats, different flows through which the workflow goes. And this is not easy for a person to switch. Just to give an example, that's a, a real graph from how a relaxation in Siesta in Quantum Espresso happens when it's run through AIDA, or even when then it uses a component of an equation of state. And you see then graphically the topology even of this graph is different. And so what we did, the last step, and that's why it's called common workflows, is we define a common format for the inputs and the outputs. We defined a very little set of mandatory inputs for a crystal structure relaxation. It was the first common workflow interface we defined. We just need to define the crystal structure itself, of course, a protocol string, the type of relaxation you want to do, essentially if you want to not move the atoms just to NSCF or move just the atoms, just the cell, both atoms and cell, etc. And the engine, so which code on which computer you want to run with which CPU resources and what time. We also standardize already a set of optional but standard metadata form inputs. So things like thresholds for forces and stresses, the electronic type, if you know it's an insulator or radio or not, it's a metal, et cetera. The spin type, if you want to use magnetic or non-magnetic systems. And in case you want to study an antiferromagnetic material, you can already specify in a common way for all these codes how to specify the initial magnetization per site. At the same time, we also standardize, of course, the output, because once you can run it, you also need to have a way to easily understand which simulations were run. So things like forces, stresses, total energy, relaxed structure at the end, and the total magnetization are all standardized. And one point to mention is the total energy here is not standardized in the sense that it's the same total energy for all codes, but is standardizing the sense that energy differences are well defined and define the forces on the atoms. Now, with this set of common inputs, as you see, it's quite limited, it's quite small, which means it's achieved this, this aspect of uh, having a relatively transparent interface. It's quite easy for a non expert to run. You just pass a structure, you say, I want something precise on quantum express on the supercomputer. But as here, as it seems here, naively, one could expect it's not good for experts. Because as an expert, I might want to change a lot of things here. I might want to use a different function. I want to, I want to use an LDA plus U or change some numerical parameters, etc. So a fully transparent interface seems to be not enough. And so let's say this graphical representation means if you have the common workflow, here let's say I didn't put any input, but let's say you might have only this common input. And this will call a number of sub workflows or specific executables with very code specific inputs. If I hide them from the caller, which is what I'm doing, I'm not asking the, 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 the user to tell me how to specify the cutoff in a given code. This makes it very transparent, but also not suitable for experts. Now, if I look, the solution apparently to, to go to the opposite, which is to make it fully opaque in the sense that any input is exposed. So when I run this workflow, I can set any single input. However, as you can imagine, this makes it okay for an expert, but not good for a non-expert. And so what was a practical solution which came up with, a kind of technical design implementation what was critical, is splitting the common workflows in two. So we have common inputs at the top, this we agree, we want them, and common outputs at the bottom, we also agree we want common outputs. But the way it's implemented is the following. The workflow, work chain is just a name in AIDA for a workflow, is going to be code specific. So this could be a quantum espresso work chain to relax an atom. The only requirement it has is to produce the output in the common format, but the input can be anything it wants, it can be very specific and very detailed. However, at the same time, the second requirement we have is that any of these workflows comes together with an input generator. 
And this time the input generator will take common inputs and will generate any output needed to be then directly passed through to the, to the, to the workflow. And so this kind of two level design achieves what we call optional transparency. So an, a non-expert user would just use the tool as a black box, would just put the common inputs, take whatever their input generator generates, pass it to the Relax work chain, and then just look at the common outputs. But an expert user could just then instead, uh, an expert quantum espresso user or siesta user could then go in, look at this intermediate output and change them at will with anything they want. How does this look in code? So like I said, it's a Python, it's all this in Python. So you essentially just load with a factory the specific implementation. Let's say I want the siesta common workflow. You import the structure in a way which is the same for all codes. You can be from a file, from a C file, it can be from a database, etc. Then you just specify again in a common format which code you want to run, how many nodes, and what is the workflow time. And then you just call this input generator I was mentioning, take the outputs, and generate what we call a builder, essentially a wrapper around all the inputs where you pass the structure, the engines, and the protocol, and possibly the other optional inputs. Now, if you are non-expert, you just submit it. If you are an expert, you go here and you add some lines to modify the inputs in the builder. Okay, this was the more technical side. Let's I move on now toward the final part of my talk where I kind of say what we do with this and what are the results. So what I showed you here is how to define common workflow interfaces to specific tasks. Here we focus, for instance, on crystal structure relaxation. However, once we have this common workflow interfaces to various implementations, one per code, now we unleash the power of it because we can now implement single workflows for advanced properties, which would need the very same code for any implementation. So what we already did, for instance, is implementation of equation of state of the association curves, because once you implement the concept of an equation of state, you just delegate the role of actually doing the calculation to the common workflow interface implementation. So now the question you might all have, I guess, is does it work? Is it possible to really make it work for 11 different codes? And well, the answer I would say is yes. Uh, the, the, one, the thing I want to stress is that in the first paper, the goal was not about uh, demonstrating numerical accuracy, but more to demonstrate the concept works and it's possible. We are now in a, we mentioned a couple of slides in the process of making a more severe or stringent set of validations as um, Stefan mentioned yesterday, uh, using this oxide set that Stefan uh, spoke about. So these are, what we did was just to pick one example per a category, we took an insulator, silicon, a metal, aluminum. We took a more complex material with a non-cubic cell to look how you know relaxation works also when the cell is not cubic, like germanium telluride. And we also looked into magnetic systems. So we looked into ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic BCC, um, yeah, BCC iron. And these are the results you get for all the different codes. And as you see, they're not maybe not perfect, but already are in very good agreement, I would say. And the important thing is that there is always a margin for improvement in the uh, in this automatic choice of parameters. As I said before, at the beginning, these plots were not as you see, or much worse. And we learned together what codes had to improve their choice of parameter, the choice of basis, et cetera, in order to achieve this kind of level of, of, uh, of agreement. And similarly, just another example, we implemented a common workflow for a dissociation curve of H2, and we ran it for all the codes, and this is the kind of level of results you get when you run these common workflows. Now, this already achieves a number of aspects. It's, uh, it's accessible, it's easy to be run, it's interoperable across codes, it's also actually reproducible. But in order to really make it accessible, we need to go even one step beyond because you know, a non-expert user might not want to install AIDA and use the command line. So the first thing we do is we release everything inside what we call the quantum mobile. The quantum mobile is a virtual machine which contains AIDA, it contains all the quantum codes I mentioned, which are have an open license. Uh, some of them just by license cannot be included. Uh, it contains all the ADA plugins and workflows. Plus, since uh, June, uh, since May, it also contains the implementation of the common workflows and actually more. It contains also visualization, etc. Actually, it's a small disclaimer: if you're running a, a tutorial or a course, we need to have a virtual machine for your code. Feel free to look into the quantum mobile or contact us. 
it's built in a very modular way. So it's extremely easy to, let's say you want a slimmer version, you can remove some of these codes or you want to add something, it's very easy to do it in a modular way. So your code will stay there also in future versions. But focusing more on the common workflows, when you start, just download it and start this virtual machine, you get a Ubuntu terminal. You can just run the command that was showing earlier from the command line and running here a quantum espresso uh, silicon equation of state with a fast protocol. I just delegate it to the daemon. This means either we run it for me, we'll run or queue the various jobs. And this can run on your laptop or you can also easily run on a different computer. At the end, you just run a command and it will show you the results. That's what you have to do. And since it was run with AIDA, you automatically have the, all the provenance. This is to run those, but also from the tests we run in the paper, what we did is to publish on our materials cloud archive, all the AIDA export file and the scripts to reproduce it. So if you go to this specific DOI, you can actually look at it. You can download everything, the AIDA export file and uh, uh, all the script to use it. And if you import it, what I did yesterday, I imported it in a quantum mobile and I connected it to materials cloud. What you can see, you can actually go and look at all the exact inputs that each of the implementers of the workflows decide to do. So here I just picked three, for instance, for custard, CS10 Quantum Espresso. If you know one of these codes, we'll recognize the inputs, hopefully. And just to give a sense, this was the input for Germanium Telluride, where we wanted to keep for during the question of state the volume fixed, but let the shape of the cell change. And here we can, if you know the code, you can go back and see how each code define this in a different way. In cast it to write fixed volume true, in uh, CSF to write MD constant volume true, in quantum espresso cell to free shape. Very different way of doing it, but thanks to the common workflow, you just say it in a single way, and it's up to the common workflow implementation to write this in the right format. Now, I'm getting closer to the end of my talk. I wanted to briefly mention the current plans. Now we are already uh, actively working in a second phase of this uh, collaboration, the common workflows. Um, we're trying to achieve a number of different goals. The first one, we are adding a number of new codes. Three already are being added. And if you are interested, just you can contact me. Uh, the Yuli KKR code, the GPO code in Denmark, and the bin 2 k code. We are extending and increasing the number of common workflow interfaces that we want to implement for different codes. I stress that each of these common workflow interfaces requires sitting down and agreeing on what is the format of the input for a band structure, what is the format of the output of a band structure, a density of states, et cetera. So it's also not only, of course, the implementation of each of them, but also the, the first part is really a design of how the input and the output for each of these common workflow interfaces should look like. And we're already looking into band structure, density of states, and pro potentially projected density of states. And then also born affected charges and the electric constants as the ingredients to then actual common workflows for phonons, for instance, based on phono pi. The other important thing that was already mentioned a couple of times yesterday and by me earlier is that we are now wanted to use this to do a proper cross active road validation with respect to cross verification of these codes uh, in a more stringent way. And what we will do is to use the set of oxides that Stefan has been presenting yesterday. So six oxides per chemical element for the whole periodic table, where we'll run the equation of state for all the codes, for all the oxides, compare them and get comparison and try to improve, understand if there is margin for improvement. Many of the codes are also code developers involved. There are even people willing to improve the potentials or other aspects. So we are very, um, say, optimistic that this collaboration will really help not only validating the accuracy of the code, but also implementing automatic recipes for anybody to run the code at that level of accuracy. And the final thing I want just to mention at the final video before concluding is that all this has been designed with the idea that it can be used in a graphical user interface. All the inputs and which inputs are available to each code is machine inspectable. So it's very easy to convert into a GUI. And what we want to do is to implement a GUI for the common workflows into our AIDA lab um, graphical user interface, which is a user interface for AIDA based on Jupyter. What I'm going to show you is the current implementation for Quantum Espresso, but as you will see, it's already ready to be expanded to any code. The way it works now is essentially you have a first a selection of a structure. You can do it in different ways, import from file, but also you can use, for instance, now the Optimate um, 
um, language to query any databases. And let's say you want to search for structure which contain silver, chloride, and oxygen. You can just click on a button, search for thanks to the Optimate API, look at the structure you're interested in, and press a button to then select the, the parameters. You have very simple inputs, which are mirroring the inputs I was mentioning earlier. But if you're an expert, you have an expert mode, then you can go in and change more advanced properties. Then you can just submit. And you let, you let AIDA and the common workflows do their job. You will have a way to inspect uh, graphically what's going on, which steps are running. And if your calculation is running, you can look live to the output uh, scrolling if you're interested. But then what's important at the end, we just go and see the final result in a graphical form you can inspect independent of the code. With this, I'd like to conclude. I just want to thank all the people who have made this possible. First of all, the AIDA Materials Cloud teams, all the people contributing to AIDA and the various plugins, all the authors of the Common Workflows project, but also all the new collaborators which are now working, to, working together for the next uh, uh, say, generation of Common Workflows. I'd like to thank also the funding which made this possible, in particular the NCCR Marvel in Switzerland, the Max European Center of Excellence, the Swiss Universities Fund, but also a number of uh, European projects like Marketplace, Dome, Intersect, Ligmap, NFFA, and a number of new ones. And finally, I want to conclude saying that on one side, I showed at the beginning how IDA and Materials Cloud make it possible to have fair access to simulation data. But at the same time, we also really were pushing toward fair simulations thanks to AIDA and the common workflows. What we already implemented and delivered are open source robust turnkey workflows for materials properties with a common interface across 11 quantum engines and more will be coming, which are very easy to use, but at the same time flexible for experts and designed to be interfaced to graphical user interfaces. And they will be the basis for verification and validation studies for this oxide set and the starting point for more common workflows. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Givoni. Uh, uh, so uh, for the next talk, I, I first I have a quick question. Sure. So uh, you, you develop uh, the common uh, workflows across many quantum code. So do you think it's possible to connect this with the high throughput computing? I mean, by varying, for example, across different crystal structure or various doping element, et cetera, combine these two. Yeah, so that's exactly our goal. So what we actually did before, actually we are already using some of these common workflows for high throughput simulations. In particular, ourselves are mostly using quantum espresso, that's because our code of choice. And that's why the quantum espresso um, plugin and workflows are relatively advanced and contain a lot of uh, robustness, as I mentioned. We have already, we are running, actually next, in two weeks, we'll be running on the next uh, pre access scale machine, Lumi in Finland, uh, for a month. We try to fill this machine with, you know, running uh, hundreds of thousands of materials. Of course, that, that what we want to do now, the other colleagues were doing the same with Siesta, with the cast up, et cetera. And what we wanted to do is also to make it easy for others to run this. But indeed, the original reason we started all this effort was exactly high throughput simulations of materials. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the onsite? There's one in Louvain here. Uh, thank you very much. It was very, very clear, uh, clear overview. I have one, maybe a little bit provocative question. Sure. How far did you go in terms of um, testing to the, to the real ultimate limit, right? So one of my former colleagues used to say, everything works for silicon. And that's the first paradigm of uh, computational material science. And obviously you have the example of, of how well things work for silicon. What is that like the biggest, most complex systems that you can push through the common workflows without breaking everything? That's an excellent question. And as you say, indeed, and as I mentioned at the beginning, the first paper was already just to convince first ourselves and then the others that it's possible to implement for 11 workflows, for 11 codes, common inter interfaces, which is already something which I think, to me at least, wasn't fully obvious at the beginning. Now, as I mentioned, exactly because of the question you're asking, what we are going to do is exactly this validation on the oxides, which I mentioned somewhere here, we know I lost. So what we will do is, let me see if I find it. There we go. We will test already any chemical elements on all these oxide configurations for all of them. And this already, I think, is very powerful 
because it will also give us quantitative agreement or disagreement between the codes. That's not enough. Of course, there are more complex systems which will not work. And the point here, again, is not the guarantee. I won't guarantee that you would that you take any structure you put in any of the codes and it will always work. That's a part of the robustness I was mentioning because many of these implementation I never saw. I mean, I had no idea of how the you know, CA or custom implementation work. I trust the people using it. But these people are, are using these codes for their own high throughput research. And I can tell you for the quantum espresso part, for instance, that we are running hundreds of thousands of materials through this. Uh, we're running the whole ICSD, the polyin file, the crystallographic open database. And thanks to a number of efforts, and again, I'm now going to speak specifically of quantum espresso, on the robustness of the choice of parameters, the robustness of the workflows and these handlers to know how to fix but also the robustness of the underlying code, which is very important. We are now able to move from, uh, you know, I would say basically 50, 60% were just running the code to 70, 80% of uh, success rate when running through the workflows to 99 success rate now by using a new implementation, uh, which has been developed at the Swiss Supercomputer Center, CSCS, uh, which is called Sirius, which uses a variational method to converge electronic structure and not an iterative method. So, in order to really get to the, to the final result of a robustness, on a 99% robustness, you need to work a lot. It's not just about the interface. What I showed you here is a way to make it easy for people to run. And I think this helps a lot also for robustness because once I give this to an experimentalist, I'm pretty sure after running five or 10 times, it will break it. But this means it's very easy to go to the experienced code developer and say, this material breaks, how would we fix it? So I think by making it easy, we also help speed up the process of robustification, if you want. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Actually, we enter into the we last- have questions. We, yes, have questions questions. Louvain. we have questions in Louvain. Yeah, please. So um, we know by now that the, the, the agreement between different DFT codes is, is, quite, is quite all right. And uh, yet, in your in your uh, approach, you propose a two-layer system into dealing with um, with workflows. Do you think it would be it would be feasible to have sort of a translator to have a unique workflow that would uh, just direct based on the engine would create the input file with the correct uh, input variables instead of redesigning every time you want to do a calculation with a different code, uh, the workflow and the specific uh, expert. Um, variables that one might want to use? So I think it's an interesting question. I think uh, uh, the answer is it depends. So as you see here, the codes we've been dealing with are very, very different algorithms and basis sets. We have quantum chemistry codes like Cauchy and Orca. We have plane wave, plane wave basis sets, Abinit, VAS, quantum express, et cetera. We have localized basis set, wavelets, and you know, all electron codes, et cetera. So defining in a unique way what the right parameters are, I don't think it's possible. And maybe one important thing to stress is, of course, I could pick the, you know, I, if I weren't, I didn't care about the computational time, I had an unlimited budget, I would just pick a very extreme parameters for all these codes, I would be sure they are converged, I would be happy. Since this comes from a context of high throughput simulations, we want to find the the smallest, but the cheapest parameters will give me converge results. So this will always be code specific, I think, especially if the methods are different. At the same time, once the methods are the same, like uh, make an example, all electron, so sorry, uh, plane wave codes with zero potential basis sets. If you take a BINIT, VASP, uh, you know, CASTET and Quantum Espresso, there we are working within the context of this collaboration to try to agree together, okay, the cutoff, which is converged as this, the mirroring we need to use as this, et cetera. Uh, but we did this design of having just a string and let the implementer of the work decide exactly because the codes are so different, even if they compute very similar properties, which I honestly doubt that would be possible to do what you say at the level of the low level calculations. But the good thing is that there are a few, I think there are a few very important low level calculations, relaxation, some basic properties, et cetera, all the rest, can hopefully be built on top of them. And so when you define what an equation of state is, as long as the calculation is converged, you don't need to worry anymore. And then you just have a single equation of state workflow. I don't know if this answers your question. 
Okay, thank you, Giovanni, for the nice talk. I have a very simple question. So I want to know if the IEDA workflow can support the calculations considering spin orbital coupling, as well as if it is possible to produce the one-year functions directly if I want to consider the spin orbital coupling. That's it. Yes, so thanks, it's a very important question. So in general, again, maybe let me, just to clarify, maybe it's obvious, let me divide uh, the common workflow interface from the actual implementation. So all codes that support spin orbit, you can run through AIDA with spin orbit. In the common workflow interface in the first round, which is this one, uh, we didn't implement or specify spin orbit just because we had to make some decision on where to stop. But already like last week we are discussing and there will be a, a few more options to act activate also you know, um, spinners and the spin orbit. So this will be possible in a few months. And it should be very easy to implement because for most calls, it's just a matter of activating certain input flags. Uh, so that's for the first part. So if you want the version you find online now, no, for the common workflow, but it will be there, I think, in a couple of months. For what concerns the Vanier functions, that are also another completely different topic, if you want, but very important. And I'm working on this personally. Already last year, we published a paper where we show uh, using the STDM method how it's possible to give a structure. And in the case of quantum espresso, run the quantum espresso calculation, then run the running functions without having to specify the input um, the, the, the input projections. There are a number of other efforts also in the literature in the past few years which do something similar. But what we did was fully implement into AIDA. And actually, there is also a tutorial online. Maybe when I stop sharing, I will put in the chat a link to the tutorial. So there is an example where you can, in a virtual machine like Quantum Mobile, you put a structure and we give you the final, um, the final value functions and interpolated band structure for you. And what we are doing now is not part of what I presented, it's part of our research. Uh, we have a new improved method for uh, uh, automatically choosing the value functions and finding the value functions, which is much more robust also in the case of spin orbit which was a bit, uh, I think, the weaker aspect of the SCDM method. So hopefully this is something we're gonna run in this big run in Lumi in a month. And so hopefully by the end of the year, we probably have a preprint where we explain this and also the code will be available. Thank you very much. Looking forward to your progress. Thanks. Um, yes, another question a bit related to what was already mentioned, but I, I have seen that uh, uh, you plan to have the, the phonon calculations implemented on top of PhonoPy, which I can understand because uh, I guess this will be a very general tool for all engines to be able to generate the phonon. But on the, on the other hand, one also knows that uh, using DFPT is uh, more um, well efficient in order to compute uh, phonon uh, band structure. Um, it, it, what, what is your plan in the future with respect to such uh, formalism like DFPT that will are not implemented in many codes, but still are, can be very useful in, in some situation? Oh, that's an excellent thank question, thanks. And uh, indeed, I mean, I, I realized when I'm now coordinating this project with no 20, 30, 40 people, maybe more, uh, it's very important to try to be kind of <laughs> concrete and uh, practical and decide a minimal deliverable, which is still valuable, and then build on top of it with the idea that this can be extended. So in practice, we decided to go for Phonopy just because in this way, we demonstrate the value, the value of this common relaxation workflows and because it's easy to do for all codes, as you say. But once the common interface to run a phonon calculation through Phonopy will be written down, and this will happen hopefully in the next one or two months, it's going to be, say, easy quotation mark. It is clear, let's put it away, I mean, not easy, but clear for an expert person of a code could be a binit, quantum express, or any other code implementing the FPT, how to just map the common inputs to their own uh, uh, workflow inputs for their code uh, to run the FPT. So I don't see, uh, so the fact that I mentioned Phonopy, just a practical issue, just to demonstrate it works and make it available for free for all implementations. But definitely I see, you know, codes like a binit or quantum express so implement or, or many of them already have actually Python implementation, I guess RBPy for you and our IDA workflows for us, which can compute phonons for uh, the FPT. It should be should be at the point relatively easy to, to map the common inputs to those workflows. Thanks. 
Okay. In a sense, just, uh -huh. to conclude, just uh, in a sense, this will let give the responsibility to the user to decide the uh, point which implementation to use, and they can also actually compare and things like this. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. So I think the point to have these common workflows to compare performance among different code. And then I, for example, I show some, uh, even the overall agreement is good between different code for aluminum equation of state, for example, there are, small, there are still some uh, small difference. So in this case, we want to make sure we do apple to apple comparison. I think the biggest, uh, well, of course we can choose the same functional, no problem. Uh, but the, I think the biggest uh, possible difference among the code are a basis set. So I think it's very hard to compare like a plain wave and the numerical basis set and the local basis set like a Gaussian type or a Slater uh, type. Uh, for example, uh, the 400 EV in plain wave cut off is equivalent to, it's a triple zeta in numerical basis set or 6311 G plus plus in Gaussian uh, basis set, et cetera. How, how could we make a real, I mean, they are equivalent in terms of basis set. I mean, the level of convergency, as you mentioned earlier, 90%, we cannot reach the full uh, convergency for sure. For practical application, we want, but we want to make sure we reach the same level of convergency. So in yes. both, in all cases, there's, for example, 90% of convergency. That's a fair comparison. Otherwise, if there are any difference, we are not sure where it's from. It can be just convergence level are different. Yeah, no, and that's the same thing yeah. for the, the shoulder potential, right? They could be different. Yeah, that's of sort of. Yeah, so maybe to answer that, indeed, the first thing you want to compare the same level of theory. And in this first, demonstrator if you want we used only pb but we're already discussing how to make for the dft implementation and now they are all dft but in principle the common interface could work also for non-dft but for the dft implementation we are now defined how to define in a common way uh the functional based on dbxc that's what our plan so we will be able to switch this now in terms of base set you're right that's the main difference but as you see here already of course there are differences like csa for some reason is different this might be because of the basis set. But indeed, the way I agree what you say, that the way in which we can decide if two set of parameters for very different basis sets are equivalent is exactly by having a quantitative error. And this goes also in the direction of error estimation of the calculations because no, we have here all electron, plane waves, localized basis set. We can say if the delta factor is within 1%, that's the kind of level of accuracy we want to achieve. And that's for what for us means having a precise protocol. Maybe a fast protocol means 10% and a, a moderate protocol means 5%. So indeed, the, the way I see we can make the equivalence is by looking at the results and defining an accuracy level and making sure all the results are with that accuracy across the periodic table. An important point you mentioned correctly is uh, for pseudo potential code, the pseudo potential. That's why I say the good thing that for the elemental element was already shown in the Delta study. We have now uh, pseudo potentials which work relatively well. What we will see now that what Stefan is doing and was already shown yesterday and we will hopefully do more in this, uh, in the context of this work, uh, sometimes the pseudo potential may not be good enough yet for more complex system with oxides and different oxidation states. So indeed, this work might point out the need of improving certain pseudo potentials for certain codes. But one thing we try to do is to compare also very similar codes, let's say, I don't know, Abinit and Quantum Espresso, trying to use the same serial potentials, same cutoffs, et cetera, to see where the discrepancies come from. And actually, I can tell you one thing which maybe was a bit surprising for us, is that there were kind of important disagreements due to this choices mirroring and size of mirroring for metals. So even things which might one might not think immediately to are at this point start to become the important discrepancy. Uh, reasons. Here, just let me show an example of a preliminary result of quantum espresso runs against uh, B2K runs by Stefan. And some come very well, some come very different. We are in the process of investigating why they're different. Some can be pseudo potential, some can be smearing, some can be something else. The, our goal is by the end of the year to, to get to a very good agreement for all of them, for all the codes. 
Thank you.